Welcome to the IB Physics Summer Podcast number two, Energy Degradation and Energy Density. Once again, welcome to our second podcast. I hope your summer is going well. Mine is. Uh, today we're going to be talking about energy density and also energy degradation. So first let's talk a little bit about energy degradation. Just what does the term degradation of energy mean? How can energy be degraded? Um, energy is a conserved quantity, so um, just exactly what does that mean? Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say that there's an energy crisis. We're running out of uh, energy. Um, energy shortage, those kinds of terms. Um, what do those things mean? Again, if energy is conserved, how can we run out of energy? Well, it turns out that energy can be in more useful forms or less useful forms. By more useful forms, I mean there are certain forms of energy that make it easier for us to extract work from that energy, which is usually what we're trying to accomplish, whether that work is lighting a light bulb or making your car roll down the road or heating your house. And sometimes energy can be in less useful forms where it's harder to extract work from that energy. So that's sort of what we're talking about when we talk about degradation of energy. Energy is said to be degraded when it's in a form, when it turns into a form that is more difficult for us to to do things with, to extract work from. Remember recently when we talked about heat engines, when we did our brief uh, introduction to thermodynamics, um, we talked about the fact that uh, the way a heat engine works is by uh, taking energy from a high temperature source, and as that energy moves from the high temperature source to the low temperature source, um, we extract work from it. Uh, heat engines uh, are found, for example, in automobiles, turbines, in power plants. There are all sorts of examples of them, but they all work on the same principle. Again, starting with a high temperature source and uh, having the energy, the heat, move from the high temperature source to the low temperature sink, and in the process, extracting work. If you remember the equation for the efficiency of a heat engine, um, if the temperature difference between the high temperature part of the engine and the, and the low temperature part, if that, energy, if that temperature difference is large, then the efficiency of the engine is higher. So in a, typically or ideally in a heat engine, we want to have a big temperature difference between the high and the low temperature region. Um, so let's kind of review what happens uh, in an automobile in terms of energy flow, and that might give us a kind of an example of context to uh, help us understand this idea of the degradation of energy. Our energy flow for, a, for a, an automobile, let's start with the, the crude oil that gets pumped out of the ground because oil prices have been in the news quite a bit lately. So we pump crude oil out of the ground and through a chemical process we refine it into different fuels. One of those fuels it, that's used by many people is gasoline. And gasoline has a lot of energy in it, and we'll talk about the idea of energy density in just a little while. But that gasoline is put into the tank of your automobile, and the engine in your car is a, a heat engine. And in the combustion process, high temperatures are produced inside the cylinders, and there's a temperature difference between the high temperature of combustion inside the cylinder and the low temperature of the ambient air outside your car. Um, that large temperature difference allows us to design a machine that will extract work and make your car go down the road. So let's start with the energy that's in the gasoline that's being burned in your engine. You step on the gas, engi uh, gas engine, the uh, energy in the uh, gasoline is being converted into kinetic energy. Your car starts to roll down the road, so now the energy is in the form of kinetic energy. Now some of the gasoline got converted to thermal energy right away. Car engines are only on the order of 20% efficient or so, so a lot of the energy goes right into heat, which goes out your exhaust pipe and out the radiator of the car. So right away, we're heating up the environment, which doesn't help us move down the road. Of that energy that does get converted to kinetic energy, now you're driving down the road in your car. The car's got lots of kinetic energy, and you eventually have to come to a stop, so you step on the brakes, and that kinetic energy gets converted 
to internal energy in the brake discs. In other words, the brake discs heat up. And so your energy that once was gas in the gasoline and then was kinetic energy now is in the form of internal energy or thermal energy, if you want, in the brake discs. As the brake discs cool off, they transfer that heat, thermal energy, that heat, to the air. And pretty soon, the end result of the gasoline that burned in your car is the environment is a tiny, Im immeasurably amount warmer. So the energy is still there. It's now reflected in an increase in the temperature of the environment. But we can't do anything useful with that energy. To be able to use that energy in a heat engine, we'd have to have a temperature difference. So you can't take heat from the ambient air and, and reject it to the same air at the same temperature. Okay, there's no temperature difference, so we can't do work. So while energy is conserved, um, the good news is, is the amount of energy on Earth uh, hasn't changed much in a long, long time. Uh, the bad news is we keep taking energy in sort of concentrated forms and it becomes more diluted in a way that it can't be uh, used to do useful work. So that's what we mean by energy degradation. We can uh, think of uh, the electricity produced in power plants and distributed to your home uh, as another form of energy degradation. So in a typical uh, power generating facility, we, we're using some kind of fuel to get water hot. We might be burning natural gas, we might be burning coal, although that's pretty dirty. Uh, we might be burning oil, uh, diesel oil type fuel. Um, we might be, we might have a nuclear reactor which is getting water hot. But in, in all these cases, we're taking energy, transferring it to water, getting the water really hot, turning it to steam. That steam expands, turns a turbine, which is like a big propeller, um, that spins a shaft, which turns a, a coil of wire in a magnetic field and makes electricity. So in all those cases, we're taking some kind of concentrated energy, be it oil or gas or coal or uranium, and we are converting it into electricity. But in the process of transferring the electricity to your house, some of the energy is lost as heat in the wire. Recall that power is equal to I squared R, so as current flows through the wire, the wire has resistance and some of the electrical energy gets converted into thermal energy. Most of the energy gets to your house, over 50% of it, but when it gets to your house, think about the various appliances and so on and whatever happens, it all eventually ends up as thermal energy. When your light bulb uh, gives off light, um, there's heat produced there, um, your refrigerator rejects heat to the kitchen and so on. So all of these energy sources eventually end up in one shape or another um, by heating up the environment. Again, the energy is still there. It's in a form that we can no longer ex extract to do work. So we say the energy is degraded. Okay, so if any of you have any questions about energy density, if you want more examples or something's unclear, um, send me an email or better still so that everyone can see your question, um, post it, post a message on CAS Manager, which is what we're using for the time being as our communication tool. Okay, next let's talk about energy density. How much energy is there, is there in a tank of gasoline? How should we measure energy density? So energy density is defined as the energy per unit mass of a fuel. So it's measured in joules per kilogram. Uh, some types of fuels have a lot of energy, so we'll often measure it in megajoules per kilogram. But again, it's the amount of energy you get from a particular amount of fuel divided by uh, the mass of that fuel. Um, why is energy density a useful measurement? Well, let's, let's give an example. Um, gasoline has a lot of energy in it. Okay? The energy density of gasoline, according to the table in uh, your Sokos book, is about 47 megajoules per kilogram. Okay? So 47 million joules of energy in a kilogram of gas. Um, a liter of gas is a little bit uh, less than a kilogram. So 47 megajoules per kilogram for gasoline. Let's compare that with a lead-acid battery, because there's a lot of talk these days about electric cars um, and how viable they are. Um, so here's a lead-acid battery. This is just a typical car battery. Now, modern electric cars are probably going to use lithium-ion 
um, batteries which have a higher energy density but just for an example let's look at the lead acid battery that's in your car um, I just went and weighed this battery and it weighs 36 pounds um, so since uh, there's 2.2 pounds in a kilogram at the surface of the earth that means that the mass of the battery is about 16 kilograms this is a 70 ampere hour battery what that means is it's a 12 volt battery it can supply 70 amperes of current for one hour. Okay, so to convert that to joules, which is what we want to make a useful me uh, energy measurement, you take 12 volts, multiply it by 70 amperes, and multiply that by 3,600 seconds in an hour, and that comes out to be about 3 million joules. Okay, so the, when this battery is fully charged, it's got about 3 megajoules of energy stored in it. So if we take three megajoules of energy and divide it by the 16 kilogram mass of the battery three divided by 16 in very round numbers is about 0.2 megajoules per kilogram so what well remember gasoline has an energy density of about 47 megajoules per kilogram and this lead acid battery has an energy density of 0.2 megajoules per kilogram in other words Gasoline has about 235 times as much energy per kilogram. So if you wanted to build a car that would store the amount, same amount of energy as a tank full of gasoline, um, you'd have to have 235 times the mass of batteries. Now this is a little bit of an exaggeration because one, electric cars have a higher efficiency than gasoline, which saves you some, some weight. And in addition, we're talking, my example, I'm using a lead-acid battery, and um, again, modern electric cars are more likely to use uh, lithium-ion or some future battery technology. But the point is, though, that gasoline has a whole lot more energy in a kilogram than a battery does by, by an order of 100 or 200 times or possibly more. Okay, so that's why energy density is kind of a useful idea, because if you're trying to decide whether a particular form of energy is useful to do something, especially in a mobile device like a car, you have to take into consideration how much energy you're going to get per uh, unit mass, per kilogram of the fuel. So I think energy density is a pretty simple idea, um, so I won't spend too much more time on it. Again, if you have questions about energy density, fire me off an email, or better still, uh, post a message on our CAS Manager group. So that's it for this podcast. Uh, our next podcast will be on fuel types as we continue through our IB summer studies. Take care.